thank you for coming out on a beautiful Saturday afternoon. It's great to be with you here. For those of you who have not been to our town meetings before, question per person, so we can get as many people in as possible. Second, uh, if you want to make a comment, if you can avoid making a speech, that will be appreciated by all of us. And third, if someone says something you disagree with strongly, we don't need to boo or hiss or anything like that. I don't think I need to mention that, but uh, once in a while, people get a little wrought up. And, and so we're happy to have all of you, and we're happy to have some children here, too, some young people here. This is your meeting, anything at all. Yes, ma'am. When will Congress begin to cut its own benefits before they cut those of the less fortunate? Health, what? pension, salary, you know, when are they going to start it themselves? Very good question. And, yeah. and, and, and in terms of health care, for example, we provide health care for all of us who are in Congress and all of our federal employees. We still have 39 million Americans who don't have health care coverage. And uh, obviously, our priorities have to be, ought to be shifted. We, uh, just as one example, we now have 23% of Americans' children who live in poverty. No other Western industrialized nation has anywhere close to that number. That's not an act of God. There's no, no divine intervention that says America's children have to live in poverty while in France and Denmark and Japan and other countries they go. Uh, it is flawed policy. It is a lack of attention to the things that we ought to pay attention to, the role and priorities. Yes, sir. Uh, <coughs> We've seen this sort of thing. I've always considered you a threat. Why have you refused to exempt Social Security from your balanced budget? Social Security, you know, is self-supporting. It doesn't contribute to the deficit. The fact is, it has surplus even masks the deficit. Carol Mosley Braun, your colleague, told me that uh, uh, she trusted this Congress and future Congresses to protect Social Security. But what's your reason? The question is, why was I not willing to have an exemption in the balanced budget amendment for uh, Social Security? First of all, if I can just talk about the balanced budget amendment and its importance to the nation. We have now, for 26 years in a row, spent more money than we've taken in. And a study by the New York Federal Reserve Bank from 1978 to 1988 said that we reduced the income of the average family by $2,500 during that period because of the deficit. And if you, know, you lengthen that, you're talking about substantial loss. As, as late as 1986, the average American industrial worker was paid more per hour than uh, that of any other country. Uh, now there are 13 countries that are ahead of us. Uh, we, we, we have slipped. And I would say, number one, the most important protection we can give Social Security is that we get a hold of the debt. If we continue the present, and Bob Myers, who was the chief actuary for the chief financial officer for Social Security for many years, uh, has said, the most important thing for, to protect Social Security is the balanced budget amendment. Because if we do not have a balanced budget amendment, where we're headed is as we pile up more and more debt. Nations historically have done this. The debt gets so big that they just start the printing presses roll. They, what the economists call monetizing the debt. And uh, we are headed, this happens historically in countries when you get about around 9, 10, or 11 percent. Mexico got into trouble when, back a few years ago, it reached the 11 percent. And that started, really, and then the, the shell became kind of hollow. We are projected to go to 18 percent, far and above what any nation has done on monetizing that. So that's number one. Number two, 
I have to say, I think everything should be on the table. I, and and I, I say that, and I have taken the stand that we should not be reducing Social Security retirement. But while Social Security is running a surplus now, starting in the year 2012 or 2013, it starts to go in the other direction. And we should be planning now for that time. We shouldn't wait until we get, you know, two years away from that. And then third, and, and perhaps most important, while it sounds fine, let's make an exemption of Social Security in the Constitution. The difficulty is you can put welfare under Social Security. You can, you know, we can, that can be a massive loophole. Since the word security is used, we can put defense spending in there. It, it, I, I think we are better in a constitution dealing in general principles and not putting the details. But having said that, I have been one who for a long time has been fighting to protect uh, the Social Security funds, and I'm going to continue to. Jenner. Yes. I've yet to hear of any attempt to cut the defense budget. All right. Question is, I've yet to hear attempts to cut the defense budget. We have slowed it down a little. Real candidly, we are spending far too much in defense. We are, we are now spending about as much in defense as the rest of the world combined. <coughs> And uh, the world has changed dramatically since we were in this Cold War struggle with the Soviet Union. I served overseas in the Army. I'm proud of them. So I want an adequate uh, defense that, that is mobile, that can meet different kinds of situations. But uh, it, some of us had a meeting uh, Thursday with the Secretary of Defense talking about the possibility of relying more on reserves and National Guard and not so much on a full-time uh, uh, group. Plus, we are spending money on equipment. We're still buying B-2 bombers. What is a B-2 bomber designed for at $2 billion a crack? It is designed to penetrate Soviet radar. Now, there are only two problems. There is no Soviet Union anymore, and there's no radar there anymore. You know, I, but, the, and this is where pressure groups come in. The, man, the defense manufacturer push for it, the unions involved push for it. You know, you have all kinds of groups that are pushing for it. But uh, this is why we need the restraint of a constitutional amendment that says, you know, we're going to have to make some tough choices, and we just can't do everything we would like. Yes. Why, why is the trust fund out of the budget? Why is what? Why is the trust fund supposed to be okay. out of the budget? And why aren't we having, why isn't it being invested? Okay, That's two questions. One is, why isn't the trust fund off of the budget? And number two, uh, why isn't it invested? Number one, and I regret to say this is a, and I say this is a Democrat, a Democratic president did this. During the Vietnam crisis, the, we were starting to go into the red. And unlike the Korean crisis, when we got in the Korean War, Harry Truman said, let's increase taxes to pay for it. And believe it or not, we went through the whole Korean War without uh, hardly any increase in the deficit. We got in the Vietnamese War. And Lyndon Johnson saw that deficit starting to grow. And he was afraid he couldn't get a tax increase to pay for it. And so he wanted it to look better. And he said, let's take Social Security and make it part of the budget. And that was done. It is called the unified budget. My belief is that ought to be off of the budget. I have co-sponsored legislation to do that. Uh, now, um, let me just say, when it's off of the budget, I don't suggest that we don't have a responsibility. And that's why I favor looking at those long-term problems now. Uh, we, we would, by making some small adjustments now, we can protect 
Social Security well into the next century, uh, assuming that we, we get a hold of the deficit problem. That's, that's the big threat. But uh, the, by having, let me just mention two examples. We might want to increase the FICA tax by half a percent. We might say everyone who is retired now continues at the present, but we might one month a, ye a year in increase the age requirement for retirement by 12 years. We're living longer. When Social Security passed, believe it or not, the average American lived to be 58 years old. Hard to believe. We now live to be 76 on the average. And the quality of life is much better. Uh, I'm 66. You know, I'm, I'm healthy. I, I, I can do a lot of things. Yes, ma'am. Uh, about what? Milk. Whether it comes from cows subjected with RBFT or RBGA. And I think we should provide with information to make our decision about this milk. And that not to give all the public that information is abuse of the aircraft house. And my question is this. You support federal legislation that would allow milk producers in grocery stores to label and otherwise inform the public that their milk and milk products come from cows that are free from RBSP. Okay. The question is about uh, cows that are uh, supplied with the RBSP injection, and should people be notified about that? Uh, let me say, number one, and you may differ with me on this, I do have a great deal of confidence in the Food and Drug Administration. I've worked with them a lot. I believe that it is for most Americans' sake. I do believe, however, that we should have things labeled because there are some things that are not safe for some people that may be safe for most of us. That is true on a, on a lot of things. So I do believe in the labeling that you call for. Yes, ma'am. single mother not getting child support or not getting it adequately. Her uh, former husband, I gather, has crossed state lines. This is a major problem. Let me just add, I think it is a problem not only in terms of people who have been married, but I think also we have to get the message across to young people, to young males, <laughs> that they have a responsibility when they father a child and that there and that responsibility is a very clear financial responsibility that the government is going to follow up on we have improved the laws on this the problem is the enforcement of the laws it is not so much the laws themselves we now have the irs getting involved to some extent uh, and believe it or we are now collecting about $4 billion a year more than we were a few years ago. But we still have a long way to go. And uh, I, I think, uh, we'll try and help with your specific case, but the larger picture is uh, one where uh, we're still not doing as much as we, we should. That one of the differences, and I understand the problems of prosecuting attorneys, you know, you have somebody who's robbed a store or somebody who isn't paying child support, uh, it's, you know, 
you can guess as a prosecutor which one you'd go, go after, and they have limited resources. But uh, this is an area where somehow we have to find the tools to do a better job. Yes, sir. First, I'd like to really commend you and thank you for your years of service. Thank you. I'm concerned, as some of others have mentioned, with the balanced budget. I really fear that what happened if that passed is that some of these very hard won social programs are the ones that are cut instead of defense and so on. I'm wondering. All right. The question is, and you you're wearing a sweatshirt that says family footsteps, and I should introduce my wife who's around here too. Where did she disappear to? Right back there. All right. Okay. He, he has concern that the social programs are going to be hurt if we have a balanced budget amendment. And I cannot give you a guarantee that they're not going to be hurt. But I would point out Congressman Joe Kennedy of Massachusetts, who is one of the chief co-sponsors in the House, made a great speech in which he pointed out what is happening now is the social programs are getting squeezed while interest grows. And this is our problem. This year, we will spend $339 billion as our gross interest expenditure. We will this year spend 11 times as much on interest as education. We will spend 22 times as much on interest as foreign economic assistance. We will spend twice as much on interest as all of our poverty programs put together. And what is happening, for example, if you adjust for inflation, between 1970 and 1993, the average payment to a family on welfare dropped 40%. During those same years, the federal government's expenditure for interest went up 1,715%. It is very clear what is happening. And, you know, interest, for which we get nothing other than higher interest rates, and that's just squeezing out all that we're doing. Fiscal year 1949, we spent 9% of our federal budget on education. This year, we're spending 2% of our federal budget on education. We do, it, it, now, does that mean when we have a balanced budget, uh, if we get a balanced budget amendment, and I, my, the difficulty, incidentally, is it, it, it will force us to make some unpopular decisions. Uh, we're going to have to step on your toes. And if it were popular to balance the budget, we would have done it a long time ago. Uh, the last, the argument against it is, and we just went through them all, we can balance the budget without a constitutional amendment. That was the argument used in 1986 when we lost by one vote. The federal debt then was $2 trillion. We just heard the same argument. We again just lost by one vote. Now the federal debt is $4.8 trillion, more than double. And if we wait for another nine years to bring it up, the same arguments will be used. The programs you believe in are going to be cut back more, and interest will, will grow even more. Um, now, it does change this, and I'll, let me give you an illustration. Back uh, three years ago, I sponsored a bill for long-term care with a half percent increase in Social Security to pay for it. Two of my colleagues in the Senate came to me and said they really like my bill. They would like to be co-sponsors if I would just drop the tax to pay for it. <laughs> uh, we can do that now. We can give you more services and lower taxes and just pile up the deficit. What, where my colleague, for example, Orrin Hatch is my, and I are the chief sponsors in the Senate. Orrin Hatch and I probably differ 
on whether or not we should have a long-term care pro program with a half percent increase in Social Security to pay for it. That's perfectly proper. That's where we ought to argue. We should not argue on the fact that if we're going to have to program, we have to pay for it. That, it seems to me, is essential. And that means that people who are for education and other things that I believe in strongly, they're going to have to come in and not only be for spending the money, that's always easy. You're also going to have to come in and say, well, let's reduce the defense spending, or let's increase the cigarette tax, or something else. We, we can't continue to ruin the future of our children. The General Accounting Office says, if we balance the budget by the year 2002, Two decades later, the average American will have an increased standard of living adjusted for inflation of 36%. That's a huge increase. If we continue to stumble along as we are now, we will at best maintain where we are now, probably decline. So the, the choices are, you know, they're, they're very severe. Yes? The student here is very concerned about well, cuts to education. It's going to affect most of the members on the student senate, and we were just wondering uh, your position and uh, how are you going to compromise or not compromise? All right. And you remember the student senate? Yes, one of the old. And and, <laughs> and you will forgive me for pointing out that you're not 18 to 22. Uh, <laughs> The, uh, one of the great things about community colleges is we are bringing in and giving opportunity to a lot of people who didn't have them before. Um, one of the things that I'm proud of for when I was in the state legislature was uh, helping to create the community college system in the state of Illinois. There were a few votes I'd like to change back there when I was in the legislature. But uh, it has been a great thing, and I, and I have to give credit to California. What we did was we just copied the California system. But uh, this, uh, this school is a good illustration of it. The question is, what about education? I, I think we have to uh, continue to invest in education. And uh, I'm going to be doing everything I, I can to fight for it. Let me add, however, just as on the balanced budget, we're going to have to rethink where we're spending money, what we're paying in taxes and other things. I think in the field of education, we're going to have to do some rethinking. Let me just give you one example. You go to school in elementary school or secondary school in Japan, you go 243 days a year. You go to school in Germany, you go 240 days a year. You go to school in the United States of America, you go 180 days a year. If, well, the first, the basic question is, can we learn as much in 180 days as they do in 240 or 243? The answer is obvious. Why do we go only 180 days? Well, in theory, it is so our children can go out and harvest the crops. <laughs> now, I, I don't know too many children in Palatine and Barrington. I, you know, I live in rural southern Illinois, McCandon, Illinois, population 402. They don't even do it down there. <laughs> you know, it, we have to adjust to a very different world. I, I got um, 75 million in the last uh, budget to pay a little bit to some schools that might move from 180 days to 210. That still leaves us way behind other countries. But it's interesting, by the time you graduate from the 12th grade, if you move from 180 to 210, that's the equivalent of two additional years of school. You know, if we want to compete with Japan and Germany, we're going to have to do we're going to have to invest more in education. That means paying teachers more, demanding higher standards, doing what we can to help students. But we're also going to have to adjust from our old ways. 
That means days of school. That means that means curriculum. We're the only nation in the world where you can go to grade school and not learn a foreign language. That was, you know, that was fine 40 years ago. Today, if you want to sell to another language, to another country, you have to speak the language of your customer. We can't speak the languages of our customers. Anyway, I don't want to get going on that, but I thank you for being on the Student Senate. And the bad news for you is, that's how I started. If you're not careful, you'll end up being a sponsored it um, I, and it is not only a matter of trusting lawmakers it's it's how the courts rule it, it, it's, it's a great many things and plus in principle I think it is sound and, and all the uh, most of the horror tales and I have to say I haven't had a question on the ERA for a while You're a lame doctor in an ideal position. <laughs> well <laughs> I, I, I have to add you would uh, right now to get a two-thirds vote of the Senate and the House might be extremely difficult. <laughs> Way back there. What is the current situation with the health care? Last I heard, uh, they interviewed Senator Dahl and after the, the last Senate thing, and they, he said, yeah, we should look at that in four or five years down the road. I'm about to be one of the 39 million, 59 years old with a heart attack, go out and try and buy insurance. No way. There should be a way the government can provide, if they had to go after the booze companies and the cigarette companies, provide a, I don't want it for nothing, I'll pay for it, but I can't pay a thousand a month. I can't do it, it's more of my house payments. It's beyond my means. I heard him say, that, uh, who, who's the great senator that took over for wax? There's no need to investigate the tobacco industry. You know, and, uh, who, who's taking care of him real good? You know, the tobacco industry uh, they hit, they're causing most, a lot of the grief with, with the health care. All right, well, let me, let me just say I strongly believe in protecting all Americans. We're the only Western industrialized country that doesn't protect all of its citizens. You're, you're, you're talking about, and when you said $1,000 a month, as you mentioned your situation, my mind clicked off about 1400 a month. And, uh, you know, if you can get it for 1000 a month, you're, you're fortunate. Uh, the, the, uh, but uh, it, it just, uh, it, it is ridiculous that if you're in the situation you're in, and the last thing you need is more stress. And if you lived in Canada, you know you'd be protected. If you lived in Italy, you know you'd be protected. And you know, and the and the the other countries. I think it is important. If we were to start off with a system that says we're going to have health insurance for people, and it's going to be voluntary on the part of employers, and if you're an employer, you can pay for your employees. And then if you volunteer to pay for your employees, you have to help pick up the tab for the other employers who don't pay for it. You know, we'd say, that is a ridiculous system. That is precisely the system we have today. And uh, it is unfair to employers who are paying it while others don't pay for it. And for small businesses, we, uh, the bill that came out of the committee in which I served, there are two committees of jurisdiction. We had it so that if you had, if you employed one to six people, you had to pay 1% of your payroll, six to 12, 2%, you know, it was graduated. So that a small business 
could could uh, handle this. But I, I just I go through this all the time. You know, I can't spend a weekend in Illinois without people coming up to me with this heartrending story. I was down in in Hennepin County, in, in, in Hennepin, in Putnam County, and this woman came up to me carrying a child, obviously disabled, and she said, my husband had insurance, uh, but we exceeded the cost. We have now sold our home. We owe $16,000. What can you do to help us? And I had to tell her, I can't do anything. You know, uh, why shouldn't she be protected? All of us ought to help a little on that. And if it's through the cigarettes we smoke or the glass of beer we drink or if it's a tax on our income, however, somehow we ought to protect all Americans. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Illinois and higher teachers are not covered under Social Security. Right now, my husband is paying $456 a month. I turned 65 later this year, and it jumps around 600 But the bad thing is, in May, the Illinois, uh, the Blue Cross Blue Shield plan is going to be broke, and it will jump much more than that. People, some of these higher teachers are earning only a 1000 a year, are their income right now, the older lady, isn't that? It is I don't a, know what to say. This is a, a specific state situation affecting retired teachers. But, uh, you know, I can, you, you tell one story, somebody else tells you, I, you know, they, they, they tear your heart out of these stories. And nobody can tell me that a country that can get a man to the moon, that can do all kinds of other things, that we can't take care of people and their health needs. Now, Will there have to be some adjustments? Yes. And for example, Canada, three-fourths of the physicians are primary care physicians, uh, general practitioners, uh, and pediatricians. In the United States, three-fourths of our physicians are specialists. We're, we're going to have to make some adjustments in some of these things. And, and real candidly, while general practitioners under a health care program probably going to make a little more money, specialists probably going to make a little less money. Um, and we're, we're going to have to make some adjustments. We're going to have to do more on prevention. We're not good on prevention, as many nations do. Cigarettes are about the only area where we're good on prevention. But we, we really have to be doing much better. Yes, sir? Yes. Uh, I'm, this is a subject near and dear to my heart because I am a physician involved in preventive medicine and environmental medicine. And um, a couple issues. Uh, Number one, when this whole thing came up in Congress uh, for uh, catastrophic health coverage under Medicare, people nearly lynched Representative Rostenkowski down in Chicago. And therefore, it looked like shortly thereafter, both Democrats and Republicans caved in to, quote, the will of the people. Um, I, I'm hearing a lot of mixed messages, um, and therefore, I support I've come around a long way. I've supported medical savings accounts because it issues, uh, it addresses the issues of freedom of choice of the physician and the freedom of choice of the patient. It gets more, it, it gets more back to the issues of, of trying to uh, uh, reinforce the old uh, doctor-patient relationship. I like some comments about the MSA. Yes. Please. For, for, first. Uh, you're right when you say there are differences of opinion. There are differences of opinion here in this audience, I can assure you, uh, on this. I'm not opposed to medical savings accounts, but that's frankly not the answer. It, that, those, those retired teachers you're talking about, you, you can't get a medical savings account to take care of, of that kind of a situation. Convert them. It, well, I, I, I am not opposed to it as a supplement. <laughs> But I think we have to have some basic protection. I also believe in the freedom of choice. I, and incidentally, that is, even under a present situation, that is uh, declining the freedom of choice, as you probably know, under HMOs and, and other things. One of the, and there was so much misinformation uh, put out on the, the health care plan. 
Newsweek magazine said 400 million was spent on to defeat the health care plan. Uh, and uh, people, people would come up to me and say, um, I'm opposed to the Clinton health care plan because I like my doctor. Well, you know, they were convinced that somehow they were going to lose their position, that we didn't have freedom of, of choice. 400 million is more than the two presidential candidates spent combined in the last two presidential elections. You know, it's just, uh, uh, there are people, we're, we're talking about uh, a $1.4 trillion industry. And there are people who profit a great deal from the present industry and who don't want change. I'm not opposed to anyone profiting. I want to pay physicians well. I want to see that pharmaceutical companies make money and so forth. But I also have, want to see that we protect all of our people. The gentleman back there mentioned he's not, no longer going to be covered. I don't know whether he's losing his job or what the situation is. But that can happen to anyone here. You know, unless you're over 65. And uh, while I have a great deal about people condemning government uh, getting involved in the health care uh, area, I have not seen a single bill introduced to get rid of Medicare. Uh, you know, I, I, and it's been very interesting. People, and all kinds of horrible stories about the Canadian system. It's very interesting that a poll up in Canada recently showed 3% of the people in Canada would prefer the American health care system <laughs> to the Canadian health care system. Yes, ma'am. Can you speak just a little? I have a little bit of a hearing problem. By the way, thanks for all your service. Well, I thank and thank you for coming. Less than a month ago, my father died in a nursing home from a seat. And the last week, he was doing a lot of care and pain. And the nursing home staff was more preoccupied with the liabilities for being responsible for my dad's death than they were only being concerned about comforting my dad in his last days. We were not adequately informed about comment is about her father died in a nursing home and in the last week did not receive the kind of care he should have and was not told the kind of options that uh, he should have been told. We, we have generally left nursing home regulation to the states. We are at the federal level providing some information now to let people know the quality of the nursing home and so that you have some, some feel. Let me just add, this is a problem that is going to grow. We're living longer, fortunately. Most of us will never have to go to nursing homes, but some of us will. And we ought to be looking at cost factors and quality factors. And let me add, and this was not the case in your father, but about 30% of the people who go to nursing homes don't really have to go to nursing homes. If we had some form of community daycare, if we have some limited at-home services. What happens is 
mom and dad are, you know, they're getting in their 80s, and the kids live in Indianapolis or some other, someplace else, and dad suffers a stroke, and mom is getting kind of frail, and the kids are worried that mom is going to hurt herself while she's taking care of dad, and so they can take dad to a nursing home. If you can have a little bit of at-home care to help with someone coming in to help with just bodily functions like bathing someone and helping on just some, some minimal task, <coughs> it would be much, much better for those people and, and for everyone. Uh, I, I think we can work out better answers. Yes? Well, I, I thank you. I am going to be retiring. And not, not retiring in the sense of a quit working or quit standing for the things I believe in, but I, I see real candidly too many of my colleagues in the Senate who stay on too long. <laughs> I think you should quit while you're enjoying it, while you're feeling good, and I think you owe that to the, to yourself, your family, and to the people of your state and the and the people of the nation. But I, I can assure you, I'm not going to become a lobbyist, and I'm not going to just go out to Florida and play golf. I'm going to I'm going to continue to be active in some way, but not as a candidate. Um, I have a concern with medical devices that are illegally marketing, distributing, selling, and assisting with the use of implanting devices that are not for people. Um, one such company has documentation about it. Uh, the FDA is refusing to prosecute this company in spite of a history of products that have been illegal, effective, and that have harmed people. As a result of that, you have people who are being disabled, you have the people who are having to go on to social security disability, welfare. You have people who are having to go to uh, spend additional medical costs. And I think the FDA should enforce the law. And I would like to respond to that. Oh, well, I will uh, take this along. I serve on the committee that has jurisdiction over FDA. I might, I might add, the FDA itself does not enforce the law. But the FDA, when there's a violation of the law, reports it to a U.S. attorney who has to make a decision. But all right. All right. Well, I will. And you have your name and address in here. Both of ours. Okay. I, I I will get back to you on that. And if I can turn this over to Mike or Eric. Uh... Yes, sir. All right. Well, I, I just made a speech in the Senate uh, a few weeks ago. Can you pull on this here, Mike? Um, I got. Believe it or not, after all the hubbub about health care last time, we didn't even actually have a final vote on health care. And uh, I, I have told my colleagues, uh, even if it doesn't pass, I want to see if we get a health care vote so we let people know where where everyone stands. And uh, it may be that we're going to have to move incrementally now um, because of um, what happened in the last election. Um, for example, one of the things that I've mentioned as a possibility that won't help you in your situation, but to say all pregnant women and all kids up to the age of six are going to be covered. That at least would be a start toward getting the kind of coverage <coughs> that we should. But if I, uh, you mentioned that you can't get insurance coverage. You have, you have a serious health problem. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. And uh, I, my guess is, we, we've just heard from two people. My guess is we could go around this audience and we would find a lot more are in this situation. They're your neighbors. You don't talk about it. It's kind of a personal thing. But it is there, and it is a real drag on our economy. Uh, a high percentage of the personal bankruptcy is not, cor not corporate bankruptcy, 
the high percentage of personal bankruptcies are caused by health-related problems. <coughs> yes, ma'am. This is another problem with the health care. Let's just say, and, and I don't know the situation here, but let's just say the teachers organization here negotiated that you would have health care coverage. And, but it does not apply to part-time employees. This is true for many kinds of private and public situations. And so we ha what has happened is we have seen a very significant growth in the number of part-time people. And when I say part-time, they may be working 32 hours a week, but they're part-time and so that people don't have to pay health insurance. Uh, if, if we had health insurance for everyone, uh, then uh, Harper College could decide we're going to, who they're going to employ and not have a health care penalty in terms of employing people. Yes, ma'am. I would like to know, when is our government going to stop punishing the people that have a little more than the others? We pay taxes forever, and now in the um, health care three years ago that passed and then it was abolished, we would have to pay immediately on the bottom of the line after our taxes $1,200 extra for those that have not. And then it would graduate yearly more and more. In other words, I should go on welfare. Why did I work 60 some years, seven days a week, to be punished because now uh, I don't need the government to support me? And I'm a product of um, 1930 depression. So I know what it is not to have a dollar and to have. Government didn't give us one slice of bread. Now everybody, welfare, welfare with the welfare. We better do something about the teenage mothers. Are we responsible for their children? I thought the parents are responsible for each child. A child. comment is uh, about welfare and uh, the health care plan called for seniors um, paying more um, and, uh, the, and the issue of teenage mothers. The, uh, let me just say uh, in terms of those who uh, of paying more on the health care bill did not go to help others. That went to see that seniors would be covered for prescriptions. That is a very heavy responsibility for seniors. Now it doesn't mean that every dollar would be covered, but it would that that's what in terms of senior citizens it went for senior citizens, not for non-senior citizens. In terms of welfare, I strongly favor and overall the welfare system. 
And uh, if you'll forgive me, you're old enough along with me since you mentioned the 30s. That's right. Do you remember the WPA? And I'm fed up with it. Okay, well, <laughs> I, I, you and I may, may differ on this. I, I favor something like the WPA, where you, where you say to people, well, well I'm, I'm introduced legislation that says you can be on welfare five weeks. After that, you have to days a week at some project that local people select. You be, and you, the fifth day, you have to be out trying to find a job in the private sector. Four days you work on, at the minimum wage. Not a lot of money, about, about $535 a month. Um, but then screen people as they come in. If they can't read and write, get them into a program. WPA was a failure, Pardon? WPA was a Let, force people to work. Let, let me just uh, let, let me just right. say I uh, differ with you slightly on WPA. It's very interesting. We have not only do we have all kinds of lodges and schools and all kinds of things built. One and a half million adult Americans learned how to read and write under the WPA. We had plays produced. We had people. When I was about 10 or 11 or 12, I read Richard Wright's book, Black Boy, and it just, it just moved me. I didn't know until years later, he learned to become a writer as part of the WPA project. Arthur Miller, who wrote The Death of a Salesman and other, learned how to write as part of the WPA project. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, we're all going to have different, but I think the big point, and I'm getting a signal from my staff, we've got to move on to Lyons Township next. But I think the big point is you have to give people pride in themselves, hope. We're too often not doing that. Uh, let, me, let me give you an example, and I'm going to get the facts wrong if there are reporters here. They don't take my figures, but when I was in the house, Deep Southern Illinois, we have the Shawnee National Forest down there. And they needed a new, new ranger station. And uh, they said they didn't have the money. Well, I got the forest people and the welfare people, and I think it was the plumbers union, the carpenters union, and the painters union together. And I said, how about going ahead? We'll hire union people to be supervisors. We'll take people who are in welfare to help do it. And I think something like 74 people worked at least one day on this. And we ended up with union jobs that we wouldn't have had otherwise. We got to something built for less money. But I think the most important, and incidentally, every one of the 74 people got a private sector job. But I think the most important thing of all, and I can't prove this, I have to believe all 74 people drive by there today and say with pride, I helped to build that. People need pride in themselves. You don't get that from just staying at home and collecting the check. I, I, I think that, I know. And I see all these other hands and I apologize to all of them. Can you speak a little more loudly? In the new budget for 95 and the budget, there's sweeping changes to the um, early childhood program under the Individual Disability Act, um, which will devastate early childhood services across the nation. Particularly, there's no funding for preschool, special ed, not earmarked anymore, with three to five, it's all going to the top, and this uh, tax cap going on around here. These types of programs are in the top of the The, the question is on the preschool program for young people with disabilities, it's, the suggestion is that they all be put in part of a block grant that would be sent to the states. Block grants sound good in theory. My experience is they are not good things. Uh, now, there may be some areas where you can do it. 
But my guess is if we made a block grant to the state and said you do with it what you want, a lot of those programs would just be lost. It, we did this in some areas of education a few years ago, including school library programs. The school library programs were funded on the average 6% by federal funds. Those school library programs have just, you know, you know they just disintegrated. The, the, during the whole depression, not a single library closed in this country. Just in the last few years, half the school libraries in California have closed. You know, I, I, I think, uh, you know, if there are programs that we shouldn't be involved in, we shouldn't be involved in. But a program like that, to help young people with disabilities, you know, I, I just think it's absolutely essential that we go ahead with. Let me thank you all again very, very much for coming out. Make it real brief that we're, we're What is your first name? Oh, but David McCullough, right. he's a Excellent. great guy. Yeah, David Powell was quoted in the Sunday Tribune magazine this past Sunday saying, Sherman's been saying that for two years. We have no interest in that. Which well, one is I, 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 Yeah, no, I'm willing to meet with you. You mentioned it, Mike. We'll thank you. work it out. Thank, thank you, Carl. Yeah. What is your name? I'm Dave. I'm going to go. Oh, you you want, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was hoping I could steal this from you here. <laughs> thank, thank you. What's your name? I'm happy to see you. And what is your name? Well, I'm happy to see he's you. Saying, he's saying about the Congress, but he came to the uh, What president. is your name? Eleanor. Happy to see you. I'm a senior citizen who wants to commend you on your balanced budget. Well, I thank you. What is your name? Roger English. Roger, I'm trying to get a deal in Washington about another matter. So. All right. <laughs> oh, you bet. Yeah. What is your name? Catherine. Catherine. I thank you. All right. I'd like to see the repertory reform with a vengeance. Well, I think some sensible, I don't know with a vengeance, but I, I, I think some sensible changes in tort reform. I mean, in case of punitive damages, the plaintiff and the lawyers get nothing. Well, I don't know about... Any award should do to reduce the... But there ought to at least be restrictions. You know, in some cases, lawyers get 50, 60 percent. I know that. And, uh, That's why I'm... I'm well, I thank you. Very much. I just want to encourage you to vote against the Henry Foster nomination in light of the situation. He will be coming before our committee, and we will we will be questioning him uh, uh, carefully. Yeah. Steve, yeah. questions if we could walk. And yeah, talk you bet, you bet. Jean Duvergeon, very happy to see you again. Yeah. Thank you. How are you? I'm fine. What's your name? Bill Brewer. Happy to see you. <laughs> I'll send you a copy. Thank you, and I would like to send you a letter. Okay, what is your name? Happy to see you. Very happy to see you. I just want to say thank you again. Oh, I thank you. What is your name? Joe Taylor. Joe, very happy to see you. Very happy to see you. Thank you. Well, I think I think there is still a chance of doing it because uh, uh, we, you know we need one vote, and I, and I have to say it's an uphill fight because you know all the votes are so visible. But I think there is a chance yet that we may be able to pick up one more vote. Oh, I'm sure with the Concord Coalition. Thanks for oh, the work on I, the balanced listen, budget. Amendment. Concord Coalition much. has been great. Uh, what we, is your we name? Tried to, Joe Dillinger. Paul Song is uh, just made Joe, 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 Very happy to see you, Joe. Thank you for your assistance. I see you have Pete Peterson's I understand your position. <laughs>
We would have, but we would have had a massive blue hair oil. Thank you. In New York State, they have dormitory authorities and everything else to get around. And the federal government can do it too. To designate one program and then let Congress throw everything that they want over that program. How are you doing? It's great to see you again. I see Kevin Jr. every once in a while. You look marvelous. Yeah, it is great to see you. Yeah, it's been too long. I yeah. know. Yeah. Well, thank you. For, and when I yeah, next time you come out and see him, stop in. Will you? All right. Great senator. No more Somalians, Haiti. I wrote you. I tried to get a more. I'm sorry. What is your name? My name is Bob Allen. Bob, I wrote a letter to you. Well, I think it's really back to religion or a lot of other things. It's DC. I say hope anymore. I don't know whether it's DC or DC. No, read a lot of that. How are you doing? Good to see you. Yeah, I said, oh, you can't do it. We see Kevin Jr. every once in a while. Yeah. Yeah. He stops by. Yeah. Is, is, uh, he does not have a job right now? No, he just makes a basketball game. Waiting table. Yeah. Why don't you have him? We know. I don't know if we have anything right now. I'm not sure why he's not. Oh, I yeah, but have, have Kevin fun. come in and talk to me. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, he stops in and sees there. I didn't realize he was without a job. You can have him come in no and talk to me. Ever. Ever. Talk to me. Say. You bet. Bill Rensley. How are you doing? Okay, I know. I know. I was in your place in Washington during the inauguration. That's bad.